Before colonizers came to this land from Europe, my ancestors lived in complex, thriving societies. We had our own systems of leadership, governance, land management, education, healthcare, and justice. These dynamic systems tend to be very different from European ones. They come from the core of who we are as peoples. And who we are as peoples comes from land. Saisi Chloe Dragonsmith Soulier, Denende Stiasti, Sitz E. Ama Brenda Dragon Hulier, Sitz E. Aba Leonard Smith Hulier. My identity is something that I think about a lot throughout everything I do in my life. I grew up in Yellowknife and I spent a lot of time out of school learning from the land and from my family. I can't remember the first time that I realized I was indigenous. It's such a, it's such a deep thread of my identity that there wasn't really a moment of revelation for that. It's just who I am. When I was 18 years old, all I knew was that I loved the land and earth and ocean science seemed right up that alley and so that's what I did. I was very bad at it though and I never actually fit in very well. I always felt like I was watching from the outside. The first time I realized that my outward appearance didn't necessarily match was when I went away to school. I would hear these sometimes very racist things they would be saying about Indigenous peoples, and they would feel safe to say that in front of me because I didn't look Indigenous. I wasn't surrounded by people who knew me and my family, and seeing their surprise and disbelief that I was identifying as Indigenous was a, was a really big eye-opener for me. The concept of walking in two worlds is one that's familiar to every Indigenous person in Canada today. And there's one that the Clichons say that really resonates with me, and they say, strong like two people. And I like that way of phrasing it because it does feel like you have to be strong like two people. I feel like I have to live two lives and Sometimes that feels like a superpower, and sometimes it feels so challenging and it feels like I'm failing in both worlds. My new friends would laugh affectionately when I would explain my race as non-Caucasian. It wasn't funny to me. You guys, shit. <laughs> yeah, I never realized that it really bothered you that you were a white, had uh, white skin. Yeah, for a while there, it really did. Yeah, thank God you snapped out of that. <laughs> like, because really. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I was the opposite. Yeah. Because I was the dark skinned one in my family as well. Yeah. And it, within my own family, I was tormented because I was darker skinned than everybody else. You know, I remember one time Auntie Joy was living in, in Grand Prairie and I, I was gonna leave Yellowknife. And I said to her, I'm gonna move to Grand Prairie and I'll come and live with you. And she hesitated. And I said, uh, don't you want me to move and be with you? And she said, well, I do, she says, but they don't treat Indians very good down here. Oh my gosh. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I can pass for not being native, she said, but you can't. It's funny because I've always wanted my skin to be more brown just to fit my own identity. So I have a hard time like knowing what that would actually feel like, I guess. You identify yourself as being native mm -hmm. and that's all that really matters. Mm -hmm is that you are, and you're proud of it. That I am. Yeah, and we should be. I haven't talked much to my own family about issues of my own identity, and 
they know me in a certain frame as who I am in terms of the family. And so I think to bring in this other frame of my life was interesting to share with them because it's a part of me that they don't get to see too often. So I used to go to Mums and Tots, and I'd have Chloe in a little uh, snuggly and bring her out, and all the nannies used to say, who, who are you looking after? Whose baby are you looking after? And they'd be like, it's mine. And they're like, that's not your baby, because Chloe had these big blue eyes. But that wasn't that unusual to me, because not only does your dad have bluish eyes, but m your grandfather had blue eyes. My mom's sisters, one had big, deep blue eyes, and the other one had gray eyes, looked like she was white. Wow. Yeah, and uh, my mom was the darkest of her family. Mm. I mean, I, when I was growing up, it never bothered me. And mom, would you say you ever um, noticed your skin color within like you and your siblings or at school? Was it ever something you had to deal with growing up or as an adult? No, I never, I can honestly say that never was an issue for me. Maybe it's because I was brown that it didn't really. And yeah, like you matched what you felt inside. Maybe, I matched what I felt culture. like inside, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I didn't have uh, any feelings of um, a disconnect. Mm -hmm. Something that I started noticing once I kind of started to gain awareness of who I was and these two distinct cultures and worldviews that shaped me, I started to recognize that a lot of the work I was doing, especially within the education system, didn't make sense to me right away. And I was kind of trying to start to navigate within it and figure out why. And then once I realized that, th that it came from a different culture, it started to make a lot more sense why it wasn't feeling right or um, why maybe it didn't feel like it fit me. That style of education doesn't fit many. It's, um, it's a, a system that is very much a, a control-based. So anytime you're punching a clock to learn, then you're gonna have challenges. When we're forced to just learn in one way, mm -hmm. it doesn't leave room for our identities within the public education system. So like you said, we'd have to take time off to go on the land and I feel really lucky that you did that for mom and that mm -hmm. mom did that for me. Yeah, because I, we used to take the children out of school for two weeks yeah. and it, they were marked absent. Yeah, just gone. Bush Kids is an on the land learning initiative where we're bringing together Indigenous learning principles and Western curriculum to create an environment for learning that's based on place and land. We are very mindful to what we call decolonized time. So instead of having periods and set sections and subjects, that goes hand in hand with letting the land lead learning as well. No foxes on the lake? No. Any animals? Well, that's where the birds sit, so you kind of are like a bird. Super soft, eh? So that's what's underneath all that. If a tree falls down and we can climb on it and the kids want to do that, that's what we do. That's the land leading learning. We're focusing on identity and how to be a capable, confident, resilient person to walk in two worlds.
Food is an important pillar of what we do at Bush Kids. Learning about how it comes to us is a very important part of Indigenous learning. So today we have some caribou meat, which is really, really special because caribou is one of the most important foods here in the north and in this area in Yellowknife. So these are caribou that I harvested last winter. These little pieces here, those are where the hooves are, and this is the caribou hair. It, it's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to take the life of an animal or to watch an animal suffer. And the place I've come to is that I think it's really important it's not about going out for sport and recreation, but rather it's about our livelihoods. It's about survival and about thriving as part of the land. It's about humbling myself and my emotions as part of this system of animals and land. It's about love and it's about respect and it's about ancient relationships. someone who consumes meat and lives as part of this world, to give that emotional labor back to the animal. That pain that I feel is the respect that I'm giving to the animal in exchange as part of our relationship for that food and sustenance that it's giving to me. By bringing wild meat into bush kids, I'm trying to help kids to develop at an early age this sense of relationship and responsibility towards the land. When they clean, for instance, a grouse, and they see it from a full bird to pieces of meat in a frying pan to getting to enjoy it in their bellies, um, they start to gain a really deep intrinsic understanding of our reliance and relationship with land. Do you guys remember why caribou are so important to us? They're our Dene people's world, our Dene people's main resources to survive. They, they ate caribou and we followed the caribou. So we followed them all over and together we survived. Canada's relationship to education for Indigenous peoples is deeply troubling. We have our legacy of residential schools where children were pulled from their families, from their cultures, from their worldview into a starkly different system that was not their own. Residential schools were designed as a tool of assimilation. So there was the aspect of educating but when you think of education as a way to fill an empty vessel, you are disregarding the person that's already there and the beauty they have to bring to this world. Every Indigenous person in Canada understands the struggle of having to walk in two worlds. No matter what colour we are or what blood quantum we are, we are 
always trying to balance. I recognize myself as somebody with a foot in both of these systems. And so when I look at change that I want to make in the world, I look at our institutions. I want to help shift our system so that they're more in balance um, with, with the identity of Canada and what our country is and the foundation of who we are here. Walking in two worlds for me in the last two months has looked like um, walking in the streets of New York City. I got dressed up all fancy. I was in the streets of this big city. I was networking. I flew home and then I flew out on a tiny little float plane to the middle of the bush where I go with my family to harvest every fall. Walking on the trails of my ancestors on the land near Fort Smith, Northwest Territories, straight back to walking on the streets of Quebec City and through conference halls and in plenaries. And so lots of people don't even recognize that there's these other worldviews operating. Um, so we're like this, we're just not balanced. So what I say to people, you know, we're not trying to, we're not trying to impose our way and say it's better, but what we are trying to do is balance the two. And that requires um, holding up indigenous systems and creating awareness. Our caribou numbers are dwindling too, and they're in trouble everywhere. And from a Western conservation perspective, it, it's quite clear, leave the caribou alone. Stop hunting caribou. But from our perspective, if the caribou, if we were to stop hunting the caribou, that's, a, that's an important and sacred part of our relationship with the caribou. And um, to stop that would mean the end of our relationship with the caribou, which would mean the end of both us and the caribou. Caribou are people and people are caribou. There's no separation. And so while both groups are saying we need to conserve the caribou, that's a, that's a very different strategy. The challenges that you experienced where you felt that racism is something that um, I'm really proud of the way that you've chose to see it in a different way. The responsibility is for each individual around racism, how you, how you either, uh, how you reconcile who you are and how you're going to be. Maybe it felt like at the beginning that you're you know, your coloring was, was working against you. But in fact, I think it works for you now. Yeah. I think that, you know, the strength of knowing who you are despite is something for other people to resolve. Yeah. It's not your problem. Being inclusive and accepting people and bringing everyone in, that's a very Indigenous value. It's part of why Canada is the way it is today, why we're such a mosaic of cultures. <laughs> our relationships with land are the deepest when we understand our reliance on land. Everything we have, our clothes, our food from the grocery store, our cell phones come from the land. And it's our participation within nature that really, I think, is the way forward. So that grounding is important, whether you're Indigenous, whether you're non-Indigenous, whether you're a new immigrant, whether you're um, a settler Canadian. I think a connection with land is important grounding for whoever you are. Ooh. 
guess I've come to see it as my place as someone who, you know, has a foot in both worlds and is not maybe firmly planted in either. I have a responsibility to build these bridges in all aspects of life. And I think in finding that responsibility, I found my confidence a little bit because I had a role and a purpose. A long time ago, I was a caribou being, but the spirit is so strong in me that I cannot remain a human anymore. So I am going back to being a caribou. The caribou boy turned around and gave one last look at his old family and he was gone. My identity can help others who are like me, but also those from different cultures to come together. I take up that responsibility in my life and my work that is going to be the deciding factor in what that becomes for me and what my own identity becomes for myself.